It is prime fantasy football trading time. My name is Chris. You're looking for some guys to trade for. I've got five of them. I'm recording this in advance of week eight. Of course, I don't know what will happen in week eight. So even if you're watching this video after, the buying opportunity may still be there. But my goal here is to give you some ideas on players I think are undervalued for varying reasons at the moment of my recording this. And I'm not nibbling around the edges. These are big names. These are potential league winners. And admittedly, some risk comes along with them too. Let's start it up. I'm getting going with Kenny Galladay. You know, I had Jeff Erickson from Rotowire on my podcast Thursday, and Jeff is as level-headed as they come. And in week eight, he had Marvin Jones rated ahead of Kenny Galladay. On the channel here on YouTube on Monday, we showed you Marvin Jones submitting his incredible four-touchdown day, and I acknowledge that Jones, hey, he was overall wide receiver five just two years ago for fantasy. He's not a bum. He can have nice value going forward. But I say this is a buy opportunity if that's what the attitude of the market is going to be. I think Galladay is a low-level wide receiver one or at least a strong wide receiver two. And if the market's about to coronate Marvin Jones and consider Galladay more of like a middling two or worse, if they're going to look at Galladay's two targets last week and see Danny M and Dizzle posting bigger numbers, Galladay running around out there all afternoon with his hand up getting nothing sent his way, and they're going to... You know, maybe not panic, but devalue Galladay. Oh no, he hasn't had more than five catches in a month. I am so in. How else do people want to be wrong about the Lions this year? This summer, too bad. They're going to run too much. Can't use any of them. Sorry, haha, Matt Patricia wants to coach in the Stone Age. Uh-oh, who is Detroit's number one receiver? I'm here to tell you. The number one receiver is Kenny Galladay. He is big and fast and a nightmare. Now, I'm not trying to tell you he's being considered a bum by the owner in your league. But sniff around. See if there's any panic. Only 25 catches. Trade them to me. Try and put together lesser players who've had hotter starts, but who are, you know, a bench spot running back and a receiver Galladay is better than. Get ponies for a horse. Okay, we'll be back in a second, and I will give you four more names to buy. We are sponsored by Audible today. Great sponsor. They've got the world's largest selection of audio entertainment, including Audible Originals, like Bedtime Stories for Cynics from Nick Offerman, and audiobooks like, for instance, my novels. And if you get one of my books on Audible, this just in, you will become a person of the book. You will be admitted into our private Facebook group forever, and you will be eligible to come ask me questions via live stream in a much smaller group than the YouTube channel every Sunday before kickoff. Start listening right now with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one audiobook, like one of my books, plus two Audible originals absolutely free. Just click the link or go to audible.com slash HarrisTube or text HarrisTube to 500500 and you will get that 30-day trial. It's fun. Go listen. Be a person of the book for free. All right, everybody. I say let's go by Marlon Mack. Was I disappointed by the stats against the Texans in Week 7? Sure was. It was a bummer. Mack is stuck on two touchdowns through six games. Yup. I think that's going to turn around. I want you to find the Mack owner who's a little bit freaked and go get him. Because I've said this before, I feel like I'm seeing a different Marlon Mack in 2019. I watch every play from every game. And instead of the bounce it outside guy always trying to hit a home run that I've criticized in the past... I think Mac is running tougher. I think he's inviting, even initiating contact. There is no reason the Colts should pull him near the goal line. Mac has been unlucky in that regard. Indy has only four snaps from inside a team's two-yard line, tied for 28th in the league. By comparison, the Ravens, they've got 15 so far. You can't tell me the Colts offense shouldn't eventually generate more in-close chances, and Mac has turned into an every-down skill set kind of player. All anybody can talk about how conservative Jacoby Brissett is, what a game manager who can make a play when he needs to. I don't know. That should make Mac more valuable, not less. I want to buy on the idea that it seems like a hundred weeks since Mac's huge national TV performance against the Chiefs, and not just three. You know, he's had a buy and played Houston since then, and that's it. Mac is an RB1. He's a top 10 running back the rest of the way for me. What I'd like to do is 
take one of my running backs, Sony Michelle, coming off a big touchdown day, and then put him together with a, with a receiver who's good, but who I don't, you know, I don't really need him, like Michael Gallup, picks him off the wire, someone like that. And I want to go get Marlon Mack because I'm impressed at what a well-rounded player he's become. Now, I know you've probably got a bunch of receivers. There are always waiver wire receivers you can try. I'm shooting higher than that with my next guy, Cortland Sutton. Now, I'm trying to avoid the Emmanuel Sanders crutch argument here. If I'm going to argue, oh, cool, Sanders was traded, that means more targets for our guy, Cortland Sutton, you can just as easily argue defenses know that. They're going to pay more attention to him. It's going to be some combination of the other guys, Deshaun Hamilton and Noah Fant and then eventually Tim Patrick, who's going to soak up the extra work. You know, either of those things could be true. I happen to think Sutton is a beast with a wingspan like a pterodactyl, and he's shrugged off his draft critics who measure things by 40 times in vertical jumps. He consistently blots out the sun down the field and makes baller catches. Yeah, he saddled with Joe Flacco, and I, I wish that were not so. And yeah, he was pretty quiet on Thursday until the Broncos got down by two touchdowns. I still saw him go deep and just somehow win down the field with great ball skills and concentration. He's not a burner, but a guy who can do that has at least the beginning of my trust. Now, you're not buying on a bad statistical output from him against the Chiefs. He had six for 87. He hasn't been below 60 yards in five games, but he also only has two games with touchdowns. I think maybe you can buy on the Flacco factor. With how terrible Flacco looked the last time we all saw him, you can idly ask the question, hey, how many good fantasy receivers can Denver really have with that guy throwing it? Maybe zero, right? But I feel the way I'm going to buy Sutton as a rock solid every week wide receiver too. I want to find the worried owner who thinks he's part of melancholy and the infinite wide receiver three sadness. I do not. Okay, so this guy needs no introduction, Alvin Kamara. And this idea could have a pretty short shelf life if Kamara winds up going out there Sunday, playing against the Cardinals, and looking good. I'm not under any illusion that the Kamara owner in your league thinks he's bad or overrated or anything like that. I want the owner who's risk-averse, who panics about injuries. Or maybe the owner whose fantasy team is 3-4 and four, and has to go win a couple of games, and is staring at a week against Arizona, maybe where Kamara doesn't play, or uncertain workload because of the bad ankle, and then has a week nine bye. For those reasons, in certain circumstances, I think you might be able to get the Kamara owner to sell. Now, not for nothing, you're going to have to give up some real and painful players. Aaron Jones and something else. Leonard Fournette and something else. You will be giving up enough in such a trade that you're not going to be fleecing anyone. You'll be assuming real and actual risk that this ankle problem could dog Kamara the rest of the year. It could bite you, but it's also a league-winning type move because the season still is long and the buy will come around at the right time. And if you can withstand the next two weeks, I think you will have a pretty decent shot at getting Kamara's ankle right and getting him back to the place where he gets 100 scrimmage yards a week just by breathing. Winning a league takes stones. This move would take stones. But if you look at your team and you feel like you're one stud shy of the full Monty and you can tolerate risk, I love the idea of buying on an injury that's serious. Could be a high ankle sprain. But odds are we'll probably get better in time for the real money games in November and December. And finally, we're back to this guy. I think the last time I did a trade for show on YouTube, I called Odell Beckham the ultimate buy low. How's that gone for you? Not that great. Beckham had a two for 20 and a two for 27. And then six for 101. It was a little bit hollow in the last game that Cleveland played before their buy. And it dropped it a couple of times. Still didn't score. That's where the insanity lies. We are six games into his season, and Odell Beckham has been healthy and still only has one touchdown. And you remember it, Monday night against the Jets. As of my recording this, he sits 33rd in wideout fantasy points, though he did have his bye. He's just 20th in receiving yards. He's been a mess. All of Cleveland has been a mess. 
and I think this is the ultimate buy low. He's healthy as far as we know. His number gets called early in all these games. They try and get him involved, throwing the ball. Plus, if you want to cry wolf to the ODB owner in your league, you say, oh man, let me take him off your hands before he plays the Patriots. The guy's just too good. This is the same logic that had people panicking on Julio Jones last year. You know, Calvin Ridley had scored all these touchdowns and Julio hadn't scored any. And people were like, see, Julio doesn't score touchdowns. He wind up going for eight touchdowns in the second half of the season. I talk a lot about playing fantasy football like you play poker. You maximize your chances by playing the right way, by recognizing that great NFL players usually turn it around when there aren't calamitous circumstances, and I don't think there are here. Do you always win at poker when you play the right way? Nope. Sometimes the other person flops another seven, and you go down. But, you know, get your money in with the best hand. And not to be too punny, Odell Beckham has the best hands. Can't promise week eight production, can't promise anything, but strongly believe Beckham has a much, much, much better second half. Thanks so much for watching. Please, please, please smash that like button, write a comment, tell us who else you'd like to see us review film on, and of course, best of all, please subscribe to our channel and then click that little bell above the subscribe button and you'll be notified whenever we post a new video. 